I'm Dr. Brad Hafford, archaeologist and economic anthropologist. Welcome to Note Nook, where I take a close look at paper money from the past. In each episode, I pay close attention to one banknote that's no longer in circulation. As an anthropologist, I'm more interested in what money says than what it's worth. And it says a great deal about the government that issued it and the people who used it. Today, we look at a 50 sol note issued in France in 1792. It's quite a small note and stained from age, but it's very interesting for what it tells us about a tumultuous time in French history. We'll look almost entirely at the obverse, or front of the note, since in this case, the reverse is blank. The obverse typically displays the clearest impression of the issuing authority at any rate, and particularly old notes often were printed only on one side. Very old notes also tended not to display a particular person, preferring geometric patterns and or allegorical figures instead. This one has two allegories at the bottom. Let's look closely at each. The figure at bottom left is seated in a rather laid-back fashion, lounging as if attending a classical symposium. It is a woman with a tied-back hairdo, and she has a very Greco-Roman appearance. She wears the Greek chiton, or tunic, and hemation, or cloak, further reinforcing her classical historic appearance. In fact, she could be modeled on an ancient Greek or Roman statue, so classical is her style. In her lap is a very large book, labeled boldly on the front, Droit de l'homme, or Rights of Man, and she holds a long writing plume in her right hand as if she herself is recording these very rights. It is clear, then, that she represents law and Enlightenment ideals. Near the edge of the book is a rooster, and this would be an odd addition to a classical statue, but it relates more directly to France. It is known as the Gallic rooster, and is an unofficial national symbol of France deriving from the Roman name for the country, Gaul. In Latin, a person from Gaul would be called Gallus, which is also the Latin word for rooster. A rooster was said to be a watchful creature, since it makes a lot of noise if disturbed. So the more precise meaning here may be that it will warn the people if their rights are being infringed upon. The figure at right is quite similar to that at left, again with the classical clothing and hairdo. She may be wearing a kind of wreath in her hair, and her expression seems more stern. More important are the symbols she bears. First is a pair of scales held aloft in her right hand, perfectly balanced. From this emblem, we can easily see that she represents justice. And at her left hand, she supports a bundle of sticks tied in a particular manner. This bundle is known as the fasces in classical Latin, and it too symbolizes justice. In the early 20th century and up through the Second World War, the fasces had an unfortunate connection with a form of dictatorial rule exemplified by Benito Mussolini's Italy, and it lent its name to this authoritarian ultranationalism, fascism. But the symbol itself goes much farther back in history and was intended to demonstrate fairness to all, which is a rather ironic symbol for fascism. Between the two allegories of law and justice is a kind of podium, further strengthening the idea that these two are part of a learned discussion or symposium. On the podium is the denomination of the note, 50S, where S stands for souls. This currency name derives from the Roman solidus, a gold coin of about four and a half grams in the late Roman Empire. French as a language has its roots in Latin, and this accounts for some of the connections we see here. The soul for the French was no longer gold, however. The Carolingian Franks adopted a silver standard of currency in the ninth century. The livre, or pound, was the highest denomination, and sol became a secondary, with denarius, or denier, being the lesser unit. The denomination of this note is also written out in French near the center, assignat de saint sol, a promissory note of 50 sols. And that's followed by payable au portier, payable to the bearer. This would imply that the note could be turned in for silver, but it wasn't really the case. Precious metal had essentially been drained out of the country in the revolution, and coin was in short supply. The assignats were issued to fill the void. 
Like most paper money, the symbols and text are meant to instill confidence in it as a currency replacement for coins. Typically, this includes signatures of banking authorities. In this case, however, there is only one signature, and apparently it was just a low-level bureaucrat, chosen because his handwriting was neat and attractive. The top of the note tells us the date of issuance. The law that authorized it was passed on 4 January 1792, and at right we see a different rendering of the date. La an quatrième de la liberté, fourth year of liberty. The first year of liberty was that of the revolution itself, 1789, so 1792 was the fourth. And the words domaine nationaux, national lands, at top indicates the stated backing of the note. Land that had been confiscated in the revolution and nationalized served as the commodity that was to guarantee the value of this circulating currency. Billions of assignats were issued, quickly outstripping the value of the land and resulting in inflation. Counterfeiting was also rather common, even though, as it states on the left edge of the note, it was a crime punishable by death. And on the right edge, we see that citizens were encouraged to inform on counterfeiters, as it tells us that the nation rewards whistleblowers. A quick look at the reverse shows that this is a uniface note, printed on only one side. And with this kind of printing, it might be relatively easy to fake. Of course, not everyone had a printing press, and there are two less visible elements that might have made for difficult copying. One of these is more visible on this blank side. And these are called tamarisec, or dry seals. They are embossed areas of the paper raised up from behind with a stamp. On this example, they're very difficult to see, so I'll try to clarify them by showing portions of a better preserved note. Somewhat surprisingly, they are ultimately royal in nature. In other words, they feature King Louis XVI despite the fact that the monarchy had been overthrown. In 1792, Louis was still technically head of the government, even though he was in prison and about to lose his own head. The inscriptions on this dry seal and on coins of the day state that he was not king of France, but king of the French people. It's a subtle difference, but one that meant the world to what would soon become a republic rather than a monarchy. The seal it left shows that Louis was allowed to reign by the law, not by any divine right. This seal has an allegorical figure with the Constitution, the Fasques, Gallic Rooster, and a Liberty Camp. Such imagery also appeared on some coins of the period. Finally, we arrive at the watermark. Watermarks are embedded in the paper so that they can only be seen when light shines through it. This one is rather large compared to the size of the overall note and consists of two circles with text inside them and lines connecting them. They're very difficult to read, but we can enhance the image and invert it so that the light areas become dark, and then we can remove the other areas to make the text still clearer. In the right circle is the denomination 50 souls. In the center are the words La Nation, and in the left circle, are three cursive letters, N, L, and R. The letters stand for Nation, Loi, and Roi, Nation, Law, and King. Again, we can find parallels in coins of the day. This all relates to the new government and the new way of looking at France. The king might have still been alive, but it was the nation that came first, then the law, and then the king. This is further reinforced by including the large block La Nation in the center of the watermark. So how does the imagery and text on the note compare with what we know of France in 1792? Well, France was struggling. It had gotten rid of its monarchy, but it was in debt and trying to use land to back currency to pay off its creditors. There were many debates about assignats in the Constituent Assembly, the new French government at the time, and ultimately the detractors were right. The currency could not hold its value, and it plummeted quickly. Initially meant to be a kind of interest-bearing bond and only usable for the trade and purchase of land, they quickly developed into fiat money, 
when they were redefined as legal tender in April 1790. The government issued more and more assignats in smaller and smaller denominations for daily use by everyday people, not just big creditors to the state. 1.9 billion assignats were issued in August 1790. Inflation and distrust quickly set in. By February 1792, the assignats had depreciated by at least 50%. Initially following the revolution, coins were still struck with the image of the defeated King Louis XVI. And this note has him in the watermark. But in January of 1793, he was executed by guillotine, and new Republican images and watermarks went into play. And the government only continued to print more assignats, around 5 billion in circulation by August 1793. And then by 1796, issues on the order of 45 billion francs existed, but they had lost all value in trade. I hope you enjoyed looking at this banknote with me. I'm Dr. Brad Hafford. Join me again next time on Note Nova, part of my series, Money Talks.